Well, if you would, open your Bibles today to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, Revelation, the third chapter, and we're going to study these verses 14 through 22 uh, together this morning. I want to just share with you, uh, before we uh, dive into these verses and study them together, uh, this is uh, the last message on these chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. We'll take a three-week break from our study of uh, Revelation. We'll start next Sunday with our Easter series of messages, three messages in this uh, series that I'm going to bring to you entitled, The Three Greatest Days, Three Days That Changed the World. And we're going to talk about Good Friday, what I call Silent Saturday, and then Resurrection Sunday. Uh, the messages, next Sunday's message, will be entitled, The Saddest Day in All the World. The Saddest Day in All the World. And Luke describes it in chapter 23 when he said, They took him to a place called Calvary, and there they crucified him. And we're going to talk about the crucifixion next Sunday. One of the saddest events uh, in the history of the world but it accomplished for us one of the most celebrated events in the history of the world. And then the next Sunday, the fourth Sunday, Palm Sunday, I'm going to bring a message uh, entitled The Saddest Day in All the World. Uh, the, the cruelest day in all the world, the crucifixion. The saddest day in all the world. Could you imagine being Mary or the disciples and Jesus has been buried. He's in the tomb. In fact, I'm going to preach that message on Palm Sunday. On that Saturday, which will be, it'll be Good Friday, I think that's the 29th, and then the 30th is Saturday, Silent Saturday. We're going to have a special service. I've never done this. We're going to have a special service. We're going to meet at 6 o'clock. And we're going to start with some scripture readings about the Passover. I'm not going to preach I'm just going to read the scriptures to you. It'll last less than an hour, and we're going to start with Passover. And once we read about that, then we're going to observe the Lord's Supper together. And then I'm going to take you from that point forward, and I'm going to carry you through scripture, through all that happened in the life of the Lord Jesus, right up to the point where they put him in the tomb and the stone was rolled away. And then you know what we're going to do? We're going to go out quiet. We're going to go out silent. Go to our cars and go home. I just want you to try to imagine how it must have been in the lives of the disciples and the women who were at the cross when Jesus was buried. Oh, but we get to come back the next morning. Amen? And that will be Easter Sunday morning. I think it's going to be really special. I hope you'll encourage and invite people to come to all these services over these next weeks as we work our way toward Easter. And I hope you'll put that silent Saturday on your, ca on your calendar and be here at 6 o'clock as we share together in the Lord's Supper. And then we're going to walk our way to the cross and to the tomb and then come back and celebrate the resurrection. Let's look at these verses of Scripture this morning in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. Before we leave this section of Scripture... I want to just kind of review really quickly and really just shortly to kind of keep you informed of where we are. And when we come back in three weeks, I'll again remind you of this spot in our study of the book of Revelation. Remember, the book is divided into three sections. We've been following that outline. That outline wasn't created by me. It was created by God, the Holy Spirit. It was given to us back in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation and verse 19. You remember that passage of Scripture? John was told to write three things. He was told to write what he had seen. That was past things. And well, what had he seen? That first chapter. He had seen the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw Jesus Christ in all of His glory and in all of His fullness. And so he wrote it down. And we've had the privilege of studying that chapter. And then he was told to write what not he had seen, but, but what he was seeing, things which are. And, and that's chapters 2 and 3. 
the church. And we've been studying about the church and, and God's communication and God's Word to the church. When we come back in three weeks, we'll be at chapter 4 and we'll be at verse 1. And I'm not going to rush through it. I'm just going to spend a whole message on verse 1. It is a very important verse where John hears a voice and that voice says to John, Come up hither. And we are transported in Revelation from the earth to heaven. And we're going to get to see some wonderful things that are going to take place one of these days in heaven. And so it's going to be a wonderful experience as we continue our study through the book of Revelation. This morning though, we come to the last church of the seven churches that the Lord Jesus communicated with as He sent letters to those churches in these chapters 2 and 3. I, I call this church the satisfied church. It was the satisfied church. Now as I was reading about this church in verses 14 to 22, I thought to myself, there is no greater contrast or difference between two churches in all the Bible than the church at Philadelphia, the one we studied last Sunday, the serving church, and the church at Laodicea, the one we're studying today, the satisfied church. You talk about a contrast, well here it is, right here in the Word of God. A church that was on fire, that had zeal for God, that was serving God. And then here is a church that has lost its zeal, it has lost its fire, it has lost its passion and dedication for the Lord. I think this is one of the saddest churches in all of the seven churches that our Lord wrote to as He sent these letters to the various churches. It's sad because here is a church that I believe is typical of the kind of churches that will be in existence before the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. In fact, the Bible tells us that there are signs. Now, those signs don't tell us when Jesus is coming. What those signs do is tell us we better be working because He is coming and we don't know when that's going to be. That's what those signs tell us. Now, there are various signs in the Bible that refer to things that will be happening when the Lord comes. Let me just mention two of them and give you two verses of Scripture this morning and then we're going to dive into looking at this church because I think this church is characteristic, it's typical of, of, of churches that will be in existence when Jesus Christ does come back one of these days. And, and here's one of the signs in, in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 1. The Bible says that the Spirit expressly says, in other words, He specifically says, that in the latter days, some will depart from the faith. You know the first sign uh, that, that the Lord Jesus is getting ready to come is what I call the doctrinal sign. The doctrinal sign. The departing from the faith. People that are walking away from the truth of the Word of God. And could I tell you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, that mainline denominations in America today that once held the ropes of the truth of the Word of God have turned loose of those truths, turned loose of those ropes, and they are departed. They are walking away from the bedrock foundational truths that have been presented in the Word of God. So we're seeing that in the day in which we live. The doctrinal sign. But, but here's the other sign. In, in Matthew 24 and verse 12, the Lord Jesus said that in those days that, that iniquity will abound, and He says, and the love of many will wax cold. The love of many will wax cold. Not only is there the doctrinal sign, people departing from the truth of the Word of God, but there is what I call the devotional sign. Something's going to happen in the hearts of people and they're not going to be as devoted to God. They're not going to be as devoted to the things of God. They're not going to be as dedicated to spiritual things as once they were. And it's a sign that we're beginning to enter into the times before one of these days the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Well, that was this church we're studying this morning. This church we're studying this morning, something had happened to the devotion of this church. Something that happened to the dedication of this church. You say, well preacher, I thought that, that everybody in the church was saved. 
you about better think again. I wish that were true. I would pray that that would be true. But Jesus himself said, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God. And so we pray that people in the church are saved. We want people in the church to be saved. In fact, he comes down at the end of this particular letter to this church and he says, I'm standing at the door and knocking. Hey, Billy Graham said the, the greatest prospect role for people to be saved are, is the role of the church. And, and, and I think he was probably correct. And so here, here, here's a church that had people within its midst and their devotion, their love, and their loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ had begun to dim. Now, they lived in a wonderful city. And I've tried to tell you something about every one of these cities in which these churches were located. And let me just share with you three things about the city of Laodicea where this church was located. I want you to notice, first of all, that it was a financial city. And what I mean by that, it, it, that was is that it was, a, it was a very wealthy city. There was a banking industry that went on uh, within the city of Laodicea. It would be like what we would call a New York Stock Exchange city today. It was very wealthy and very prosperous. In fact, when I was studying about the city of Laodicea, in AD 17, the city was destroyed by an earthquake. And so financially stable and prosperous was the city that they didn't have to receive any aid from the Roman government in order to rebuild their city and get themselves back up and going again. It was that wealthy and prosperous of a city. It was a financial city. It was a fashion city. There was a, a wool, a, a sheep that they, they raised there that had a black wool it was very luxurious and it was very expensive and it was the part that created industry for that city. They were known for that black wool. They were known for that expensive piece of industry and garment. And not only that, it was a fitness center. There was a school there. And from that school, that medical school, they developed a virgin salve, they called it. It was a pill. You crushed it. You made a mixture out of it and you eat a plaster, and you'd put it on your eyes, and it was supposed to have healing properties. Now all of these things are important because Jesus is going to speak to this church in a little while, and we're going to find out that this church was so financially prosperous that they didn't think they had need of anything. Now isn't that something? When you get to the point that you don't think you need anybody, you don't think you need anybody. You don't think you need God nor man. You've got yourself pretty proud right there, have you not? And it had got themselves in a spiritual mess. And so you see, he, he, said, he says, you, you're going you're gonna to need something else other than what you're depending on. So in every one of these things that they trusted in, the Lord Jesus is going to show them, you need to trust in something more than that, and that something is me. See, here's what had happened to this church. This church had become complacent. This church had become indifferent. I could have entitled the message the Who Cares Church because they were just sympathetic and guess what? Who cared? They didn't care. Nobody cared. They weren't worried about their condition before God. They weren't worried about their ministry before their community. They just simply were spiritually indifferent and apathetic and nobody cared. And, and here's what God taught me. Complacency and indifference to spiritual things always results in coldness and insensitivity. Hey, you let a church get complacent, you let a church get indifferent to the things of God, and the next thing you know, that church is going to get cold. That church is going to get insensitive. It'll get insensitive to its members. It'll get insensitive to the Lord. And it'll get cold in its relationship, not only with God, but also with one another. But you let a church have a zeal for God. You let a church have passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. And brother, when you come into that church, there's a warm feeling you feel in there. There, there is love that you feel in there. And the reason you feel it is because God is in there in the lives and in the hearts of His people. And so let's talk about this church for a few minutes this morning. And there, there are four quick things I want you to see as the Lord Jesus 
shares this letter with the church. First thing I want you to notice is the personality of the church. I want you to notice the personality of the church. See, really, the personality of the church shouldn't be made up by the pastor. It shouldn't be made up off the deacons, even off the membership. The personality, the driving factor of any church ought to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I've told you, Jesus describes Himself. He gives a picture of Himself to every one of these churches. I want you to notice in verse 14 the picture that Jesus gives of Himself. Notice He says in verse 14 to the angel... That was the pastor of the church of the Laodiceans right. These things, now watch what, how Jesus describes himself. These things says, in other words, here's who's talking, and here's what he, how he describes himself. He says, I am the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now we've got three phrases I want you to look at. Jesus says, number one, I'm the amen. And then he says, number two, I'm the faithful and true witness. And then he says, number three, I'm the beginning of the creation of God. Three wonderful things about the personality of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's look at them individually. Number one, he says, I'm the Amen. Now what that teaches me is that Jesus is the confirming one. Amen. Hey, you know that's a good Bible word right there, by the way. Did you know that? When you, when you use the word amen, you're using a Bible word. You understand that? That's a good word. In fact, you know my two favorite Bible words, and I've been doing this for 56 years. February the 16th was 56 years I've been preaching the gospel. And so I've been doing it a long time. I've been studying this book a long time. I have two favorite words. They are my all-time two favorite words. They will not change. I promise you they won't change. I've had them for a while. They're not going to change. You know what they are? Grace and glory. Those are my two favorite words right there. Grace, that describes what happened to me. And glory, that's describing what's happening in me and where one of these days I'm going to go. Grace and glory. Those are my two favorite words. But you know my third and fourth favorite words in the Bible? Amen. Amen. And hallelujah. <laughs> that's it and those are important words you need to make sure you got those words right too I was reading a story about that this week about an old, old country boy who saw a mule that he wanted to buy and he, and he told the guy he wanted to buy him he asked him what he paid for him he, and he got it priced right and he, he said I'll buy the mule he said now you need to understand one thing before you buy this mule he said okay what is he said this is a religious mule he said what he said yep it's a religious mule he said well now how so he said, well, you can get on him and kick him all you want. You can say, get up, whatever you want, he ain't going to move. But if you get on him, get settled and say, hallelujah, he'll stay. And so he said, I, I, I don't believe it. He said, I'm telling you, honest to goodness, it's true. He ain't going to do nothing else. But when you say hallelujah, he'll go. And he said, now you've got to remember this, and you cannot forget it. You can pull back, you can say, whoa, whatever you want to do, he ain't going to stop. Unless you say, Amen. So he said, I'm telling you, you better remember these two words. They're very important. He ain't going unless you say hallelujah, and he ain't going to stop unless you say, Amen. So he said, I don't believe it, but I'm going to buy him on your word. And so he did. Climbed up in the saddle, sat there and said, kicked him, you know? Nothing. Hallelujah. Old mule started. He said, well, my goodness, he is a spiritual mule. And so... You know, he got to going along a little bit. He decided, you know, I want to go a little faster. He said, hallelujah. Boy, he picked it up. He said, well, this is real good. He said, hallelujah again, man. He picked it up again. And he got to liking that, you know. And he, he decided he wanted to go a little faster. He said, hallelujah. And he, he got to going a little faster. Hallelujah. He got to going a little faster. He got him up in the low. And then he looked up, and there was a cliff. And he, for his life, couldn't remember that other word. And so he thought, hallelujah, and he got faster. <laughs> and he got scared, and he said, hallelujah again, and he got faster. He's in a full gallop run now, and he's headed toward that precipice, and about that time he got right to almost to the edge of it, and he remembered, he said, amen. <laughs> and the old mule just came sliding to a stop. He wiped the sweat off his brow, leaned back in the saddle, and said, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just telling you, you need to know these words, folks. You need to know your Bible words. Amen? 
Man, amen. You know what that word means? That word means so be it. That word means you agree. I'm telling you when the preacher's preaching and you say amen, you say that's the truth. I, that's the truth. I believe in that. I believe in what he said because that's the truth. When Jesus says, I am the amen, he's simply saying to you, I'm the truth of God, ladies and gentlemen. I'm God's final word to your life. I'm the word that you need to hear. Here's a church needed to hear the truth of the word of God because they had veered off from the truth of God's word. I'm the amen. He's the confirming one. But number two, notice these three words. He says, I'm also the faithful True witness. He's the consistent one. Not only is he the confirming one, he's the consistent one. Now, now watch the watch the words. I'm the faithful, true witness. He says, I'm the faithful one. That means that he will never dilute the truth of God. He's faithful to it. He's the amen, which is the truth. And he's the faithful one. He's never going to dilute. The truth. He won't water it down. Hey, you, you, can't, you can't water this book down. You can try to, but you can't water it down. It's just going to say it speaks. If you read it, it's going to speak to you. He says, I'm the faithful witness. That, that, that's he won't dilute the truth. He says, I'm the faithful true witness. He won't distort the truth. And I'm the faithful true witness. He won't deny the truth. God's Son, Jesus, is truth. Look, when He speaks, He's not speaking personal opinion. He's speaking permanent truth because He is the truth of God's Word. So He's the, he's the confirming one. He's the consistent one. He's the controlling one. Notice He says He's the beginning of the creation of God. What does that mean? Well, that means that Jesus is created. I won't have time this morning, but you just jot down Colossians 1, 16 and 17. Those two verses tell you that nothing that has been made was made except that Jesus wasn't a part of the making of it. In fact, verse 17 of Colossians 1 tells you that all things consist by Him. And what does that mean? It means they hold together. Hey, I got news for you, ladies and gentlemen. It, 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 it isn't gravity holding things down. It's Jesus holding things down. I got news for you. This world would fall apart. It would fly to pieces this morning if it wasn't for the controlling power of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the good news is that's the Jesus who's in control of your life and my life who's in control of us. And so here, here's the personality of the church, the one speaking to this church. But not only notice the personality of the church, I want you to notice the problems in the church. Because this church had some problems. It had some issues. Notice verse 15 and 16 and 17. In verse 15, Jesus said, I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. Isn't that interesting? He'd rather have you one way or the other rather than straddling the fence. In other words, Jesus had rather just have you out and out against Him or out and out for Him that you can't make up your mind which way you are. Isn't, isn't that something? In fact, he said, you're either with me or you are against me. That's the way Jesus put it. That's what he said. I, I could wish that you were. Verse 16, so then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'll spew you, vomit you out of my mouth, because you say, and that's interesting, verse 7, you say, you say I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know. The problems of the church. And there, and there were three. And quickly, let me share with you what they were. Number one, there was what I call a problem of possession. Now, now you've got to go back to, to verse 14 to see this. And I'd almost missed it, to be honest with you. I want you to look at verse 14. It says, and to the angel of the church. Now watch the, watch the reading. To the angel of the church of the who? Of the Laodicea. Now go, now go back, I won't, you, can, you can follow this in every one of these letters, but go back to verse 7. In the same chapter, verse 7, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man's open. You notice what he said? And to the angel of the church where? In Philadelphia. But down here he says, To the angel of the church of what? The Laodicean. You say, well, what's the, what, 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 what's the point? Well, the point is here's the church who had reached up there and taken control of itself rather than allowing God to take control of it. You see, you see there's a difference there. 
of the Laodiceans. Hey, you ever tried to take control of your own life? Yeah, boy, I had some testimonies in here there on that. We all have, haven't we? We all have reached up there and grabbed the wheel every now and then, hadn't we? And, and here's a church that had done that. You see, here, here's a church that was having a problem with who owned it. Hey, guess who owns this church? Not me. God owns this church. And He runs it, you see. He's the one in control of it. He's, he's, the, he's the beginning of the creation. He's the one in control. There was a problem with possession, that, that, who, who they were submitted to. There was a problem with passion. You notice Jesus says, they're not, you're not hot or cold. You're just lukewarm. You know, I just like my, I like my coffee hot, period. I don't like cold coffee. I'm not like Jesus. I don't want it hot or cold. I just want it hot. In fact, I like everything hot. In fact, when, when we go to a restaurant and order soup, my wife says, four-minute rule. They look at her crazy. Well, the four-minute rule is, I don't care how you brought it to me, I need you to put it in the microwave four minutes before you bring it to me. Literally, I want it ball, and I'm honest to goodness. I guess I've burned all my taste buds up, but, but I, I, that's, that's how I want it. I want it hot. What, what, what Jesus said, I, I, don't, I don't want you lukewarm. See, the, the sin this church had committed was the sin of lukewarmness. That, that, it, and, and the only way I know to describe it is this. They had lost their passion for the Scripture. You know, they weren't hungry for the Word of God anymore. They, 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 they came to preaching, endured preaching, but they didn't enjoy it. See, they weren't hungry for it. And, and, and uh, they, they not only had lost their passion for the Scriptures, they had lost their passion for the Savior. They had lost their passion for service. They, they, they weren't excited about the opportunities to serve God anymore. There was a problem with possession. They had tried to control things. There was a problem with passion. They, they were lukewarm. And then there was a problem with perception. They didn't even know where they were. You know, it's one thing, it's one thing to, to, to be in a bad way, and it's another thing to be in a bad way and not even know you're in a bad way. You know that? I, I love this story. Preachers get uh, uh, stories told on about preaching long, and I guess we do preach long. <laughs> I got to hurry up back there looking at that clock. About a little boy went to church with his dad and he, he noticed there was three lights back there on the back, in the back. One was a red light, one was a yellow light, and one was a green light. And, and, and he asked his dad, he says, what are those lights? He said, well, we're on television. And he said, when the red light comes up, the preacher knows he's got five minutes before we go off the air. He said, when the green, uh, red light comes up, we've got five minutes. When the yellow light comes up, he's got two minutes. And when the green lights come up, he's done. We off the air. Well, the little boy wasn't too excited about going to church in general that day. And so, man, he, his eyes were on those lights. And when that red light came up, he just smiled. He said, I got five more minutes. <laughs> and then the yellow light came up. He was getting ready to go. I got two more minutes. The green light came up. The preacher kept on preaching. <laughs> he looked over at his dad and he said, Daddy, ain't it sad? He said, what, son? He said, he's finished and he don't even know it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Isn't, isn't, isn't that sad spiritually, though? Isn't it sad spiritually for people to be finished and they don't even know they finished? To be in trouble and they don't even know that they're in trouble? That was the problem of this church. But watch. God never ever just gives you a problem without providing you a solution. And, and that brings me to my third point, and that's the prescription for the church. So what was God's prescription for this church? And really, it's, it, it's really threefold. Notice what he says to him in verse 18. He says, I counsel you. In other words, I'm going to give you some advice. And here's what he says. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold, gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich. They thought they were rich, see. And white raiments that you may be clothed. They thought they were, had the greatest fashions in all the world. And he says, on down and anoint your eyes with I say that you might see. They thought they had the greatest doctors in the world. And here's what Jesus says. If, 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 you, if you become lukewarm, here, here's a prescription to get back on fire for me. Number one, return to spiritual values. In other words, return to spiritual values. They had put all their uh, confidence in the, in the gold and in the silver of Laodicea, in the banking industry of Laodicea. And Jesus is saying, you, you may have a lot in the bank, but you are spiritually bankrupt in the bank of heaven. 
So what you need is to get some stuff from me that you can't get from this world. You realize this morning Jesus has got some stuff to give you that you can't get from this world? He has things to offer that you can't get anywhere else from Him. Or I'll return to spiritual values. Or return to spiritual virtue. See, they thought they had some of the greatest clothes in the world, the greatest fashions in all the world. And Jesus is saying, hey, you may think you're, you you got the latest styles, but you are spiritually naked. And you need the white garments of the righteousness of God in your life. And then there, there, there's a return to spiritual vision. See, they thought if they had a little like, vision problem, they could get it fixed with putting some of that, that, that salve on their eyes. But the Lord Jesus is saying, you may have 20-20, but you're spiritually blind. And guess what? There are people like that today. They can see good physically, but they can't see spiritually. They're spiritually blind. And so He gave them a prescription to change where they were, to get that zeal and passion in their life back. And then He gave them, and this is the final truth, such a beautiful passage in 20-22. through He gives them a, a fantastic promise. Now, now I want you to notice this, this promise. It is an absolutely unbelievable promise. It, it's the promise to the church. No, notice what he says in verse 20. He says, Behold, and we all know this verse, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him, dine with him, and he with me. And then watch verse 21. To him who overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me in my throne. Four quick things about this promise. This is the promise to the church. First thing I want you to notice is that it's a present promise. You say, well, what do you mean by present promise? Notice what he says in verse 21. Behold, and me and Luther done got a, we done got a, a country boy's translation of behold. It's called look at him. That's what that word means. Look at here. Behold, look at here. And what he said. I stand at the door and knock. And he, he, here's what I mean by a present promise. He's knocking. But he doesn't just knock today. Guess what? He's knocking tomorrow. And he, he's not going to just knock tomorrow. Guess what? He's knocking the next day. You see it? It's present. He's knocking and he keeps on knocking. Now one of these days the knocking will stop. One of these days it'll stop. God's going to call his church up. And the opportunity will be over. But today it's a present promise. I'm knocking. And then watch. It's a personal promise. Do you notice what he said? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If what? If anyone. Anybody. He's knocking. It's a personal promise. It's a promise to each and every one of us in this room. It's a personal promise. And it's a precious promise. Notice what he says. If you'll open the door, I will come in to him and watch I'll dine, sup with him, and he with me. There isn't anything more intimate or precious than dinner. Now, you know, I have often said I would not have made a good Jew, but then there are sometimes I would have made a good Jew because they always had three meals. I'd have made a good Jew. Because <laughs> my wife will tell you, I believe in three meals. She says, man, I have an eternal clock, an internal clock. And, and it does. It goes off about seven. And when I get up, I'm ready to eat. If I get up at four, I'm ready to eat. She ain't ready to cook, but I'm ready to eat. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and the Jews, they would have a morning meal, and it was a big meal. We call that at our house big breakfast. You know what big breakfast is? It's all of it. Yeah, it's eggs, it's grits. Yeah, grits, not hash browns, grits. We... <laughs> It, it, it's, it's all of it. That, that's big breakfast. Sausage, the whole deal. Bacon, it's all of it. Big breakfast. Our grandchildren like big breakfast. The Jews had a big breakfast. Their, 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 their middle of the day, their noon meal wouldn't be as big as the breakfast meal. But then their big meal was supper. And they called it supper. The Bible refers to supper, ladies and gentlemen. That's a biblical word. That's my sixth favorite Bible word right there. <laughs> supper. Supper. See. Well, look what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, if you'll open the door and you'll let me in, I'll come in and I'll sit down and we'll dine together. Isn't that something? Isn't that a precious picture? See, it's a, it's a precious promise. 
It's a personal promise. It's a present promise. He's knocking down. And it's a powerful promise. Because he says, if you'll do this, guess what? You'll overcome. Just like Jesus came into this world and overcame and went back to heaven, guess what? You and I, if we'll follow him, we'll, we're going to overcome. And we're, we're going back to glory. We're going to go to glory. And we're going to sit down at the throne of God with Him. Isn't that something? What a precious promise He gives to those who will believe in Him and who will trust Him. Holman Hunt painted a picture of this verse years and years ago in his famous painting. And when he finished it, someone looking at his painting said to Mr. Hunt, you made a terrible mistake when you painted the painting. And Mr. Hunt said, and how so? He said, well, you've got Jesus at the door and you've got Him knocking, but there's no doorknob on the outside. And Holman Hunt said, the picture hasn't been painted by mistake. It's been painted that way on purpose. You see, the doorknob is on the inside. And you know what? That's so true, isn't it? If we want to experience God, guess what? we got to open the door. We have to open that. If we will, and when we will, then He promises us, I'll come in, I'll dine with you, and you'll dine with me. And I promise you, that's special fellowship right there. That is special, special fellowship that God offers to us. And even... If our heart has grown cold, guess what? God can reignite those fires if we'll open the door and let Him in. Would you bow together with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word today. Thank You for this message. A church that was in great need, but a church to whom You reached out to and gave a prescription that could change everything for them. Thank you that there's always hope in you. And Father, today, may you draw people to you as they open the door and let you in. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.